Okay, everyone, welcome to the Unreal Specialization course. Um, this is the first week of content, and essentially, we'll be just getting used to the Unreal environments, um, how to import objects, navigate the interface, set up all your folders, and essentially just get started making some games. The end goal for this session is to use some pre-existing assets from the Quixel store to create a lake scene and environment like the one you can see on screen at the moment. So first I'm going to assume that everyone has opened up the Epic Games launcher and they've navigated to the Unreal Engine tab here. Um, and then we can either launch Unreal by going up here um, or we can press the library tab and that's where you can see all the sort of projects you've got as well as any um, Assets that you've installed before So hopefully under library you will also have Quixel bridge installed here, which comes default um, If you don't please install that by clicking here um, and Make sure you have that ready to go and I think you should be able to install that in the background while we get started with the rest of the tutorial. So we also want to make sure that we've got the correct version of Unreal Engine, which is 5.1 here. Um, and then we can press launch here. And you can also check what sort of plugins you've got. So yes, I've got Quixel Bridge installed. Um, so we're going to launch our project with 5.1 here. Now this first open, you probably will find takes quite a few minutes. Um, because it has to compile a lot of shaders before opening it the first time, uh, especially on Mac. But I found that after that first launch, uh, it's, it's pretty good. Once your program is loaded up, you should come to this view um, and you'll get this every time you launch Unreal. So this is sort of the project window where you can see if you've been working on any recent projects, they'll appear here. So you can just launch straight back into it. Um, so what we're going to do first is set up a new project and we are going to eventually make our way to sort of a first person game, but we don't want to be a first person shooter. So we're going to choose a blank scene here and just make sure that we've set up our project location correctly. So this is the sort of default location inside our documents and Unreal projects. What I will say is if you're working across multiple PCs, the easiest way to do it is definitely to use an external drive. Um, just make sure you've got it plugged into a fast enough port on the computer and work off of that SSD. Um, you're going to have a much better time than trying to do a lot of the cloud work with Unreal um, because it's a binary system that gets quite messy. And I've been trying to work on some collaborative Unreal projects at the moment using GitHub and it's just a bit of a mess and they want you to use their kind of proprietary software that costs a lot of money. Um, so I think the manual method especially if you're student work, if you're working on multiple PCs, which I assume you will all be working on the PCs here and at home, um, I'd really recommend having a drive that you can work from. Okay, so we're gonna choose a blank project. I'm going to name my project tutorial project. Um, and I might just make this the sort of master project that we go through week on week, um, but you might wanna create your own week one, week two projects for the tutorial. Uh, I'm going to make sure that I've got Blueprint set up here. Now, there's a lot of discussion about whether to use Blueprint or C++ in the Unreal space. Kind of the understanding that I've reached from talking to the team at Epic is that they want you to kind of use Blueprint wherever you can because it automatically culls processes to let you hit those FPS timeframes whereas C++ is kind of forced to update every frame and it doesn't have those efficiencies built in. So what they've said is use C++ for your sort of larger data management systems and then Blueprint for your interactions and stuff that's happening frame by frame where possible. Now your 
choice here doesn't actually matter that much. Um, I would say just pick Blueprint and you can still use C++ for bits later. Um, if you start off with C++, it's harder to integrate Blueprint. So we'll start with Blueprint as the default. Um, our target platform is going to be desktop and I'm on a pretty good computer. So I'm going to choose maximum and that's going to give me all the sort of high quality rendering features um, where scalable is based for, it's more for last gen sort of hardware. Um, we can choose whether we want to have the starter content as well. Um, I think I'm going to leave this unticked and we can just import things that we need. And I'm also going to use ray tracing as off um, because we're not going to get into ray tracing in this project. And actually a lot of Unreal's sort of newest features like Lumen and Nanites don't rely on hardware based ray tracing. So we've got all of that set up. Um, we can now go ahead and create our project and start getting into it. Okay, so it took a minute or two for Unreal to load up and now you can see we're in the starter scene. Now, it's a bit interesting that Unreal starts with this kind of <laughs> pre-made landscape, but I guess it's just kind of flagging that this is what Unreal is made for and what it can do is make these giant expansive worlds. And in some ways that is what we're going to be focusing on throughout this course. So perhaps it is fitting, but it, it does give you a lot for what's supposed to be a blank empty project. Um, but we'll go through and, and open a new scene shortly. So I think the first thing I'll do is just show you how to kind of move around your 3D view here. Um, and then we'll go through the different sort of UI hierarchy and tools that we've got at our disposal. So the first thing we can do is hold down our right mouse button and we can look around. And then left clicking in our scene will allow us to select things. So you can see I'm selecting parts of the terrain here and I can click over here. Um, and then for basic movement, while we're holding down this right mouse button to look, we can press W A S D and move around kind of in our first person space. Um, now you'll notice we're moving really slow and actually we're not moving that slow. It's just that this is like a multi kilometer virtual environment. So we're actually going quite quickly. It's just sort of huge. This is tuned to be a almost standard walking speed, I guess. Um, so there's two ways for us to change our speed. So we can change our speed up here. So we can turn up our camera speed to eight. And now you can see, you know, we're going more than twice as fast. It's kind of a nonlinear scale. Um, and then this is, yeah, so it's like we've got a, a speed scale and then the actual speed we're going. So this value will multiply the speed value. So if we go two here, now that's twice as fast as what we were going before. Uh, if we do four, that's four times as fast. But this is a pretty slow, janky way to change our speed. So how I probably would get into the, the habit of moving around my scenes is by using the scroll wheel. So if we scroll up, you can see we just start moving faster and it kind of just accelerates our speed permanently. So even if I stop and then I start again, I'm going at that higher speed. And you can see our actual values up here aren't changed. Um, and then if I wanted to slow down, I can just scroll down again. So it takes a little bit of getting used to, especially if you come from Unity where you're using like shift to speed up a bit faster. Um, but I think you really get into the hang of it and it's sort of like you scroll up to zip around to the other side of your environment and then you slow down if you want to do sort of more detailed movements and, and adjust your camera. The other thing we can do is also press F. So if I select a zone over here and press F, I can put that into focus by tapping F. 
Um, so that's really useful as well. The other sort of camera movement in the editor space is using Q and E. So Q and E will make you fly straight up and down. Whereas W, A, S, D will translate you. All right. So now I think we should all have sort of movement on lock. <laughs> you should be pretty comfortable moving around your scene and let me know if there's any questions around that. Um, in terms of the rotation I mentioned before, if you want to sort of click and rotate an orbit like you would in Maya, if you hold Alt and then left click, then you're orbiting around an object. So keep that one in mind as well. Um, you can also hold Alt and right click and then you're panning in and out with your mouse. All right, so you might have noticed as we click around here, things on the right side in our outliner are being selected. So this is like Unity's, uh, I believe it's called the hierarchy view. So this just lets us select the objects or actors as they're named in Unreal. So not game objects, but actors. Um, it lets you select all the actors that are currently present in your scene. Um, and we would refer to scenes in Unreal as levels, um, which is a very gamey way to talk about them. So in your level, you can see we've got all these different things that come pre-made. So we've got our lighting, which is in a nice folder for us. So you can see we've got like a directional light, fog, that sort of thing. Um, and as we select different items here, um, it's going to open up the detail panel, which is our controls for that actor down below. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a new object in to this scene. So what I'm going to do is add an object by coming up here to this little cube with a plus. Um, and you can see we get the option for all of our different actors in these sort of tabs and menus here. Now, what's great about Unreal is that you can search literally any menu. So if I just start typing sphere here, I'm going to get all the different things that have SPH in them. So SPH. Um, I could also probably search basics and then it would show me that menu. So you can also search your menus if you're not sure which thing in the menu you're looking for. Um, but yeah, the search feature is pretty key and I think it, um, it really helps the learning curve because you might know the name of something you're looking for but not know exactly where it is. And you can see I can do that for these blueprint classes. I can do that in the outliner, of course. I can search and, and filter my objects like that. And even when you go over a object like the landscape here, um, I could search something like, uh, oh, I'm searching something that doesn't exist here, but we could search for the scale and then we'd just get the scale value. So it lets us really quickly um, filter down on, on what information we're actually after. So I'm going to go back to this cube button here and we're going to search for a cube. And you'll notice there I was hovering over this. So when I search cube, nothing came up. But if I make sure my cursor's over this, then I've searched the whole menu. Um, and I'm going to grab a cube. So you can drop that into your scene like that and sort of place it and you can't see it because it's too small. Um, or you could just click it once and then have it drop in in the center of your view. Now you notice that cube is, now you kind of get the, the sense of the world. Um, this is a one meter by one meter by one meter cube and it's pretty small. So we've dropped a cube into our scene and um, I guess we should probably start with talking about the scale and coordinate system within Unreal. So within Unreal, units are in centimeters um, and you'll notice that here, if we sort of move 
um, our cube, we're moving it in 10 centimeter increments. So you can see here that our X value is updating by 10 centimeters. Um, our cube is at a one-to-one -one scale, but this is actually a meter sized cube. So it being one here doesn't mean it's one centimeter. It means it's at a one-to-one -one scale, but the mesh itself is a one meter cube. Um, and then the other thing to talk about is the X, Y, Z system. So unlike most of the other 3D apps that I use, like Maya and ZBrush, um, your Y axis in Unreal is actually your depth, not your vertical axis. So you'll see as I move the red here, which is the X, we're going to go, this is kind of left and right, I guess. So we're going left and right. If we move the Y, we're going to actually go forward and back. So this is our depth, left and right, forward and back. And then our Z is our height. Um, now, to me, I always think Y is vertical. I remember learning that in maths. Um, so it, it takes a little bit of getting your head around it, depending on what you've been using in the past. Um, but that's just something to keep in mind. Y is depth. What we're going to do is change the values here all to zero. So I'm going to click in the box and type zero and press tab to go to the next one. Um, and so now my cube is at zero, zero, zero. And I'm going to press F to locate it within my scene. So it was just down here on the ground. Now you can see the pivot point for this cube is in the ground and I'm going to scroll down so I can do some more detailed movements. Um, the, the pivot point of our cube is in the center. So our cube is now halfway through the earth. Um, and I'll show you how to move that in a second. One little tip that's nice for moving objects around though, is if we bring this back up a little bit off the ground and then I press the end key on my keyboard, which is almost towards the number pad. So the E and D key key, it's actually going to ray cast up from the ground to the first point on our object that it hits, which is the center of this cube on the bottom face. And it's going to snap that to the ground. So immediately we've got an object that's flush to the ground, um, no trickery needed. Um, whereas in, you know, Unity or something, we would be positioning that by eye um, or changing to like a Y view. One thing that's interesting to note here is you can already see that our lumen system is sort of doing something here. So we've got like a nice screen space reflection happening around our cube. And you can see that sliding around as we move on this reflective plane. Um, great. So now we can get into how to sort of move objects around in the editor view. So by default, if we've got something selected, we're going to have this gizmo, um, which has got our different axes on it. We can press E and that's going to take us to the rotation mode. So we can rotate um, and we can press R, which is going to let us scale up and down. And so you can grab the different pivots here to scale along different axes, um, or you can grab the center pivot to scale uniformly. All right. And we're just going to control Z that to undo it. Now, one thing that's really useful, if we go back to that problem we were having of how do I sort of affix this to the ground without pressing the end button. Um, what's really neat in Unreal for positioning things is that if you hold Alt and then middle click somewhere, on your object, your pivot is going to snap to that point. Now that might not sound mind blowing, um, but in other game engines, you're basically stuck with either the center of your object or a built-in pivot that was saved into the metadata of your object. But with any object in Unreal, you can just hold Alt, middle click your mouse, and then now we're pivoting from that position. So if you imagine this is a door, oh, that's really freaking out. 
Um, if you imagine this as a door, then, you know, we've already got hinge pivoting um, and we could build that into an animation straight away. If you want an object to have that position saved, so if I wanted it to always pivot from this, because if you notice we click away and then click back, we're back to the center. If I wanted that pivot to always save, I could right click my object after I've picked that and say uh, pivot, set as pivot offset, and then that's always going to be the pivot offset. Um, if I wanted to reset that, I could also come in and go reset pivot offset. And now we're back to standard cube. Another good trick while you're kind of positioning objects is that you can hold alt down and then click one of the gizmo points and drag out. Um, and you can do that with rotation as well. So go ahead and try creating something interesting and just getting a handle on how to move objects around. And you can also decouple that grid system that's turning on. Here we've got positional snapping. So here I've now decoupled that one and I can now drag objects free from the grid because before we were snapping to 10 centimeter increments. Um, I can also do the same for angles. So I can angle this however I want um, or I can keep it snapped to 10 degrees. I think snapping is generally pretty useful. Another thing of note on the topic of moving objects around is that if you want to mass select objects like this, um, you can also press control alt and then drag out a rectangle. So that's sort of similar to um, unity in that way. I do find it's a bit annoying because there's no inbuilt way to make things unselectable or, or non-selectable, I guess. Um, so you can see we accidentally picked up our landscape here. Um, so you might have to either disable the landscape, which sucks, but that works. And then you can turn this back on um, and then we could, you know, duplicate the whole thing. Okay. Um, so you should now all have a thing. Um, so that's good. <laughs> what we might do is now hop into another level and I'll start showing you how to set things up and the rest of the, the UI as well. One thing that's sort of quick to note is um, a lot of what Unreal is used for is like beautiful landscapes, which we know. Um, a really good way to start doing some look development is shaping your lighting. Um, so you'll see we've got our sun coming over from over here in this scene. Um, a really easy way to quickly iterate that is if you press Control and L and you'll see we get this little 3D gizmo that comes up here. Um, and what we can do is if we press in Control and L, we can move the cursor around and actually shape where we want the sun to come from. Um, this is a new feature and so it doesn't... Previously, you would have to kind of dial in the numbers and... Um, do everything that way, but this is just a really nice sort of arty way, I guess, to develop a look quickly. That's really responsive. So I might try to get some um, sunset look like that. Um, and now I've got the sun coming from that direction. And you can also see it happening sort of real time in the sky. So you can see we've got the sun moving around through the clouds and we've got all these beautiful volumetric clouds built in. Um, so that's pretty nice. So why don't we go with something like that? Um, and you can see built in, we've also got ray trace, uh, not ray tracing, God rays and everything like that built in, uh, which you can see sort of shimmering through, but I'll, I'll show you how to set those things up from scratch in a moment. All right, so the last thing I'll show you before we start building our lake environment is our content drawer. So you can open up the content drawer by pressing this little tab here. Um, but the easiest way to open it up by far is just control space up and down. Um, and, you know, that's really quick. 
And this is like your project, um, oh, what's the word in, in, in Unity? Um, yeah, it's, it's just your sort of project folder where you've got all of your bits and pieces that go into your scenes. Um, and so you can set up as many folders as you want here. Um, but what you do have to do is work in the content folder. You can see it doesn't let me create or import anything outside of that. Um, and that's because packages will get sort of imported here um, while your content for your game goes in here. So what we might do first is set up a few folders and you'll have to bear with me as to why we're setting these up and then what the different things are. So the first one we're gonna set up is a new folder called levels. So I'll press enter there. And so I've got my content tab selected and I'm right clicking here to set up my folders. So right click new folder. We're going to have one called blueprints. We will have a folder called mesh and then we'll also have a folder called materials. Right, so what we're gonna do is first go to our levels folder and we're going to save. Um, and what we'll do is we'll go file, save current level as, and then we'll go into here and we'll just say it's the standard app. Oh, I just forgot you can't use spaces, so you can do um, underscores like that. All right, so we're going to save our standard map into the levels folder. Um, and so to do that again, I went to file, save current level as. Um, there's also a control alt shift s, which will just save everything. And I'll explain that in a moment as well. Um, what we're going to do now is go to our levels folder and make a new level. So I'm going to right click and choose the level and we're going to call this lake. Shoot. And then let's open up your new scene and we'll press save selected. So we're in a new level now. We've got our lake shoot scene. So you'll see we've gotten into our world and it's pretty blank. Um, this is what you would expect with a fully blank environment. And even if we go ahead and add in a cube, unlike Unity, uh, we don't have any sort of default lighting, so we can't actually see anything. So if I go ahead and add in a point light, um, well then, yeah, now we, we start to see things and, and that's how you would construct your environment. So there's no by default scene lighting. So because for the start, at least we'll be mostly focusing on exterior worlds, we're going to set up another physically based lighting system akin to the one that was in, well, I say akin to exactly like the one that was in the default environment. Um, now we could go ahead and go to lights and then add our directional light um, and then go to visual effects and start adding in all the different bits and pieces that work together. Um, but what's really great is that under windows here, we've got this environment light mixer. Um, and if, if you struggle finding that, like all of our menus in Unreal, we can search environment. Oh, no, sorry, I'm under the Windows tab. We can search environment or we can search light. Might be even better. Um, and open that one up. So there is a light mixer and an environment light mixer. So make sure you take uh, pick the environment light mixer. And so you'll get this view with all of the different pieces and components that work together in a physically based lighting system in Unreal. And so we can just quickly create all these different pieces. Um, and we can also access all the settings for those components that we just added um, here in the environment light mixer tab, um, or we can access them in our view here. So immediately we have our clouds and we have a sun, a nice midday sun, and we can press control L and we can direct that sun however we like. So maybe this is a good starting point.
So we've got light, we can see things. Now we just want a nice base for our scene. So what I'm going to do is, um, you can see the gizmos here are actually at the center of our world. So it's nice to kind of, you know, technically it could work anywhere and it's an infinite, almost, well, an almost infinite world. I think Unreal supports worlds that are about a kilometer or two by default. And then they have these big worlds, which sort of are for open world games that simulate hundreds of hundreds of kilometers and are optimized to break up your content automatically and, and do that thing. So that's, that's really nice. Um, but anyway, we're not interested in that at the moment. We just want a base for our world. So what I'm going to do is go to the quick add up here and we're going to go under basics. No, we're going to go under shapes and pick a plane. Um, and so now we've got our plane. Um, I'm just going to zero this one out. So it's the center of our scene once again. So you can see that. And um, it's a one meter by one meter by one meter. Let's imagine that we've got a sort of small size mm -hmm. lake, I guess, which is maybe like a hundred meters by a hundred meters. Um, and so that's, you know, it's a decent sized lake. Maybe it's, maybe it's a bit longer. It's more like a, a river. We're going to kind of create a canyon scene. Um, so maybe something like this is appropriate. So 100 by 200. And this value actually doesn't matter. This, this should just be one. All right, so we've got a nice plane. Now we need to start importing some assets. Um, so what we're going to do is open up our content drawer once again. So control space. We're going to go to our content folder and we're going to, instead of dragging something in from outside, we're going to actually right click here and we're going to say add Quixel content. And what that's going to do is launch Quixel Bridge. Now do make sure that you're signed in up here. Um, it should automatically pick up your Epic Games, but I found that I had to sign in again. So do that, it might take you a few minutes. And we're going to start finding some assets. Let's go for this one, Gigantic Canyon Sandstone. So if we click that up, we can heart it, so we can add it to our favorites, which is nice. Um, and then what we might wanna do is download it. And that's definitely what we want to do. So <laughs> we can choose which quality we want to download it. We're going to use Nanite um, objects here, which does mean that we have to download the full res object. So storage space wise, it's pretty demanding, um, but otherwise it's not too bad. So anyway, we're going to download that one. So we'll start that off downloading that. And we're also going to download a sort of, um, we want like a bluff or like an island or something in the middle. I think this looks pretty good. Uh, sandstone, but I don't know if that's the correct way to say that word. Butte. So we'll download the butte there and that will form like a kind of island in the center of our lake canyon scene. Um, so you might want to kick off a few different downloads at once. They do take a little while. Um, I guess the next one we're going to want is our water texture. Um, so let's do that as well. All right, so I finally located the asset that I wanted. I knew it was in there. It's called swamp water. Um, you'll notice that because they're just 2D, that doesn't have a nanite option, but we'll download the highest quality one. All right. So now that that's downloading, um, we can actually go over, or well, once it is downloaded, I guess, we can go over to our local assets section and we can go add. And that's going to import it straight into Unreal. And we might want to minimize that one. So you can see we've got our material, we've got our mesh, which you won't see the preview of yet because it's still kind of generating. Um, and then we've got our textures that go along with our material. And that's been automatically placed under a Megascans folder. 
So what we want to do now is drag in our boot, boot. Um, and you, you can see that it's going to take a sec to generate the static nanite mesh, but this only happens the first time you bring it in. All right, so you can see now we've got our amazing sandstone cliff imported. Um, and then we can check if we're using nanite by going down to our mega scans mesh and right clicking this one. And then just checking if nanite is ticked here. So that looks good. That's switched on. Um, the other way we can check that is if we go from the lit mode here to our nanite visualization. And let's just do the overview. Um, as we kind of get closer, you can see that uh, maybe there's a better one here. Maybe it's clusters. Oh yeah, I think clusters. Yeah, that's a better, that's a better look. So yeah, there we are. Um, that's what is being rendered in terms of nanite clusters. Um, and then as we move closer, we're going up in resolution. So now it's probably a good uh, time. I mean, I guess this is as good of an explanation as you'll get um, <laughs> with what nanite is, but it's essentially a geometry visualization technique. Um, I'm not a computer science person, so I don't know the sort of ins and outs of how it works, but essentially Unreal is good at knowing when it can cull a piece of geometry and sort of simplify it um, based on distance. And so it does that. So when we're up close, it's rendering all of the polygons or however many it needs. And then when we're further away, it's rendering less of them. All right, get a little bit off topic there. Um, so we're back in our lit view and we've got our really high res cliff here. So what we're gonna do first is just create a bit of an environment. So let's keep our cliff kind of um, to this same scale because we want it to be accurate and nanite meshes are, uh, sorry, quicksil meshes are always gonna be imported at scale. Um, so we're gonna use our same technique here to sort of create the shell of our lake. So I'm holding Alt and dragging that out and then I'm going to rotate this and I'm going to move this one here. Um, what we might want to start doing as well is while we drag something out like this, we could invert the scale. Um, so let's do a negative one. Oh, I wanted the x-axis. Let's do a negative one scale and that's going to flip our cliff um, so that it's not as noticeable that we're tiling the same object around. Um, so then we can grab this one and drag that out. So once we've got a shape like this set up, um, what we could also do is grab all of our objects. So we could control alt drag and deselect our plane. Um, we could also duplicate, so control D and we've got a copy. And then we could also go, oops, accidentally deselected everything. Um, we could then choose transform and then mirror X. And then it's just going to flip that entire selection on the global X axis, which is really nice. Um, and then we might want to just do the same thing again to some of them. So it doesn't look as constructed. Um, now, obviously, if you had, had more time and you were doing this on your own world, you would probably mix in different cliff types and make it look all nice. But, you know, this is good enough. It can be a bit shit for the tutorial. Um, great. So we've got our sort of walls created. Um, we might want to just add another these sort of caps at the end to close off our shape. So let's flip on the ooh, uh, Z. Oh, let's flip on the Y. All right, there we go. Great. So we've got our cliffs. Um, one thing we might want to do now is grab all of them and then come up here, create a folder called cliffs. 
and I've just put all of the cliffs in a folder. Okay, so we've got our cliffs in. There's a couple of spacing things happening here. So what I'm going to do is just raise up the floor a bit. And now that's cleaned up all those holes. Um, and what we're going to do is add a sort of water texture to the ground here. So what I'm going to do is go back to Quixel Bridge. And now if we go to local, we should have our other two assets downloaded. So what I'm going to do is batch select both of these and then press add. And those have just been imported in. And now we can close down our thing there. Um, so I'll show you the water next. So if we go to surfaces and then water, we've got our swamp water here. Now you notice that this is a material instance. So if we drop our swamp water in and you go, oh no, it looks terrible what's happened here. So one thing we could do is fix the, the kind of tiling of our texture here, um, which we could do in two ways. So one, we could just double the size of our plane here. So instead of having like a long rectangle, we've got a square. So that's what it was like before. And yeah, maybe let's just do that. So the UV has a bit of time, um, but you can see it's huge. It looks ridiculous because of the size of the <laughs> the materials being kind of spread in um, the same scale as our main environment. So what we could do here is double click on our material and now we get our material editor. Um, and because this is a material instance, it's going to look a bit different than a regular material. And I'll show you the difference shortly, but that's because it's referring to a master material. So if you see down here in this menu that comes up, we've got a parent. And if we double click on the parent, then we get this view, which has got our parent material. Um, and so this is the sort of standard view for a material if you were creating one in Unreal. Um, and if we were to edit this one, it's going to edit all of the different iterations of this material that are around. So this is our master material. We can see that we're getting a tiling value from somewhere. So we've got a material function called tiling and that's being fed to all of our different texture channels and then going out into the shader itself. Now if we come back to our settings here, we, we have like a global override for our tiling. So what we can do is just increase this one. So we know that it's a, 100 meter lake. So if we do like 100 meters, that means that every sort of um, every it's going to be applied to every one meter in a tile. Basically, you can see that happening there. It's become much smaller. Um, and then if we zoom in now, we're getting much better tiling, which, you know, it looks a little bit ridiculous when you're out here, but when you're a bit closer up that's looking more correct and you can see unreal already coming through <laughs> with the um the nice reflections there so 100 might be too much tiling let's try halving that to 50 and see what that looks like and i'm just pressing Control s to have that update as i work um, and yeah maybe maybe 50 is a bit better all right, um, one thing to note as well is that, so when you open up the material editor, which by the way, I'll show you again how we did that. So we went control space and we double clicked here. Um, we can also dock this as a tab up here. And so that lets us just switch back and forth between the two views rather than having to like close or minimize a window. Um, we've also got lots of other control over different things like the roughness here. Um, so what we might want to do is make everything a little bit rougher because right now it's a bit too crystal, if that makes sense. Um, so let's increase the roughness a little bit of our water. And maybe um, we can do some subsurface scattering as well, but make that like a sort of dark green color. Um, so that's looking pretty good. Uh, we could also tint the water a little bit if we wanted to. So we could 
we could get like a more swampy color if we wanted um, and you can see the effect there so now I've got a green tint we should do something crazy make it hyper real looks a bit shit um, <laughs> if you wanted to do something that's kind of vaporwave you know, pink lake. We have a pink wet lake in, in Melbourne as well. Um, so, you yeah, know, maybe it's not too crazy. But, uh, yeah, so we can start playing around with the controls there. I will show you how to set up new materials shortly as well. All right. So let's stick with that. And then the last thing we need to import is our... We'll import our Canyon Butte in the center here as like an island. And I'm just going to scale it up a little bit. Um, so you might want to have one island and then like another smaller island. And you might want to adjust your lighting a little bit too. So we could have some nice harsh midday lighting. Quite like this sort of look light catching the edges of things here yeah that looks great to me okay so we have a scene um, we've got some lights we've got some rocks what we might want to do now is create a character so we can run around in it um, one thing I'll, I'll say first as well is while we're developing our space it's sometimes helpful to have like a few different preset views so that you don't have to keep sort of moving your camera around. So if we're developing for like, let's say this to be like a main perspective that we look at the environment from, we can press control one. And then if we press one, it's going to snap back to that position. So then we might have like a top down one that we use for moving objects around. So that could be two. We might have a sort of overview of the scene. We can see everything going on. That could be three. Then we might have like a detailed look um, like this, which is four. So we're pressing control four. And then I can just flick between those different views, which is quite handy. So by now you should have put together a pretty decent looking environment using our Quixel assets and we will continue to develop and add complexity to this environment next week. But for the next part of this tutorial we'll work on creating a basic first person character controller so that you can actually run around this beautiful environment that you've constructed. So to create a first person controller what we'll need to do is set up a blueprint. So blueprints in Unreal are like the code-based building blocks for everything either static or interactive that goes into our scene. And if we open up our content browser, which remember we press control space and right click in the empty space, you'll see this menu appear, which lets us create different sorts of assets. And one of the basic asset types is a blueprint class. So click that one and we'll open up another menu. So here we can see a few of the different types of blueprint or the different common classes. And I'll just explain what a few of these do. So actors are sort of your standard basic class and they represent anything static or interactive in your world. So that could be something like a button that you go up to as a player and click. It could also be a piece of generative art, which we'll look at next week. And so actors are your general class for all static and interactive objects that do require some sort of programming or functionality in the world. Next, we have pawns, which you would think of as non-player controlled characters like NPCs. However, in the case of an online game, you would have pawns that are controlled by other players and then the pawn that you control would be the character. 
which brings us on to the next type of blueprint class. A character is a type of pawn that includes the ability to walk around. So essentially, this is just a pawn that we would control as the player, and there's a lot of inbuilt variables and systems and nodes that are going to help us create and set up that character with doing very minimal effort. You could think of it as a library of all these tools that are useful for making characters and Unreal is going to do a lot of that work for us. Controllers are more like a management blueprint, so they could exist in your game world and allow you to control your character, but it doesn't necessarily exist as an actor inside the world that moves around. Game mode bases are similar to player controllers in the way that they're used as kind of a management or a game admin tool, um, and we would use that to store information that the entire world and multiple different actors have to refer to. So to kick things off, we're going to create a new character. So I'm going to click on this one here, and it's going to create a new blueprint class inside my blueprints folder here. And I'm going to name this one FPS controller. And so I might want to position my FPS controller in the world. So like any sort of 3D object, um, actors can have 3D components and they exist and can be placed in the same way as other objects. So I can simply drag my blueprint into the world here and drop it down. And you'll see if I press F to focus on it here, that it's already got a capsule collider and it's also got this blue arrow that signifies which way the character's pointing. So I've just positioned the character where I want it to start. So it's gonna start at kind of our viewpoint four area with the arrow pointing and looking out between these two rocks. So that's where I want the player to first spawn in. Next, what we can do is open up our content browser again, and we'll double click on our FPS controller to open up the editor for that blueprint. And like with the material editor that we opened up, we've got a few different tabs here and I'll explain what you use the different tabs for. So the viewport is the 3D representation of our character and what it will look like when it's dropped into the game world. So here we can see the same blue arrow that we saw in our tutorial view and that signifies the forward direction of the character. Here is where we could add a 3D mesh for our character if we were doing a third person character, for example. So I could go up to the add button on our components tab here, remembering we're still in the viewport, and I could add a mesh. So I could go ahead and add a cube, for example, and I could scale that cube similar to our character. And then if I hit compile, well now in our view, we've got the same cube and our character exists with a sort of cube body. So that's how you would set up a third person controller. And you could also go ahead and add a camera in the same position, sort of behind the cube. So I'm going to position my camera like that. And then you could imagine if we were playing the game, we would have the perspective of the camera here and then the cube body here in frame. For now, we're going to delete both of those things because we're going to just make a first person controller. So it has a built in camera and we don't have to see the cube or the body. So I'm going to remove those components. The next tab we'll talk about is the construction script tab. And this is essentially your void start. So these are all the sort of functions that you wanna happen when the character spawns in, so the first time. We're not gonna use this for our FPS controller now, but it's good to know for the future if you wanted to have, an, uh, have any game logic occur right at the start of your game, you could enter it here. We're going to go over to the third graph then, which is called the event graph. And this graph can run in real time, so it updates every single frame. And 
more often than not in Unreal, we're going to be looking for events and using those events to trigger our code. And our code is in the form of these node blocks. So to navigate this sort of node view, you can use the right mouse button to pan around. And I might make this a little bit bigger. I'm gonna stretch this out here. Let's get a bit more space. So you use the right mouse button to pan around and you scroll in and out by zooming. You can also select a bunch of nodes at once and then you can move them around to organize your space. So left clicking and moving things like that. We then have these pins that you'll see come out from a node. So here we've got an execution pin and when we hover over it, it gives us that little tool tip. Um, and then we have more specific ones that might take a piece of data. So you can think of these white triangles as the actual event. So this is like the go button. And then these other ones either output data if they're on the right side, or they take a data input on the left side. Now we're not gonna use these at the moment. We're going to actually import some different inputs in here, which are gonna be the player inputs when we sort of touch the controls. And then we're gonna use those to move our character. So what we're going to do is head up to our edits here and go to our project settings. And there's a few things we need to set up. So in our project settings, we're going to scroll down to the input section and you can see we've got this bindings area here. So in the bindings area is where we assign different key bindings or mouse movements. This is also going to work for game pads. And we essentially assign those to different values and events inside our input system. So we'll start off by setting up our character's translation, which is our movement forward, backwards, and side to side. So what we need to do first is set up two axis mappings. And these are going to be for our different axes of movement. So one is going to be our movements forward and one is going to be our movement rightward. And I'm naming them forward and rightward to avoid the whole X, Y, Z debate, but I'll explain how the values sort of line up. So this might look familiar to you. It's a Cartesian plane and Cartesian planes basically refer to space in two dimensions. So we can imagine our movement as left and right and forward and back. So that's why we've got rightward and forward. So our rightward vector is going to move up in the X axis by default. So if we wanna move left, we're gonna to have to go negative in the left axis. And the same can be said for the Y axis. So to move forward, we have to increase our value in the Y axis. And to move back, we need to decrease that value. In Unreal, instead of a Y value, we would refer to that as the Z axis. So heading back to our inputs now, in our move forward, we're going to be wanting to use the W key. And that's going to increase our value. So all we need to do is under our axis mappings again, click this little keyboard button and then press the W key and that's registered the W key. And now our forward axis is going to increase if we press the W key by one. Now we need to add the backwards. So I'm going to press this little plus button here again and add an S. So clicking the keyboard, pressing S and setting this one to be a negative axis. Next, we'll do the same for our rightward vector. So for our rightward vector to increase the value, we're going to use D because we're increasing it along that Cartesian plane. And to decrease it, we're going to use A and that's going to be a negative value. So we'll save that and close down our project settings again. And now we can come back to our FPS controller and actually import those values that we just created. So first I'm going to delete this event begin play because we're not going to use it for our character. And we're going to start by bringing in those pieces. 
So what we can do is right click and we could either go through the menu here and search for what we needed. So that's kind of the slow way. We could come down and find input. We could find our axis events and then we can choose the move forward and move rightward. Or since we've named those nicely, we can just search move and I can see our move axis events here in the list. So import both of those, we've got our move forward and we've got our move rightward. And you can see there I accidentally imported the wrong move rightward and it's just the axis value itself being returned. We actually need this one with the event. So I'm gonna delete that, right click again and find the correct one, which is the event with the little arrow here because it's got the ex execution arrow here. So from here, it's pretty straightforward to set up, but there is one small catch. So what we can do is attach our inputs to a preset node, which is part of the character blueprint class. And that node is called add movement input. So to add that and automatically connect it, I'm going to grab this pin here and drag off and release with my mouse. And now I'm searching for something that's compatible with this event. So I can search add movements inputs. And now every time our move forward axis is triggered, it's going to add movement to our character. So we'll do the same thing here, add movement input. So we've got movement input on our forward and rightward direction. The next thing we need to give this node here is a direction to move because right now it doesn't have a direction. It's just zero, zero, zero. So for movement forward, we are going to want to give it a forward moving vector direction. So what I can do is drag off this yellow pin and see now we're doing the opposite. We, we're dragging off an input and we're going to give it an output. And we're going to say get forward vector. And now we've got our input move forward set up. And I'm going to do the same for our rightward. That's going to be get rightward vector or get right vector. So we can test that out quickly by going back to our lake scene and just make sure you press compile up here, which is the save button for our blueprint. It compiles the code. And we can come back to our character and there's one thing we need to enable, which is the possession of this character, which is a very funny gamey term. But essentially, because Unreal is set up to have multiplayer enabled automatically, like Fortnite, um, we need to actually say that this is the character that me, the player playing on this game client, wants to possess. So what I need to do is find the possession value of our FPS controller. So in our hierarchy or our outliner here, I'm actually going to just search the value possess. And you can see that we've got this pawn section here and auto possess player is actually disabled. So what I can do here is choose zero and player zero by default is the first player. So that's going to be I am doing essentially. So now with auto possess player selected as player zero, we can now press play and start moving around. But unfortunately I missed connecting something here and you can see we're sort of just moving by ourselves and we're going into the wall. So to see what's happening there, there's a few things we could do. Um, we could, go back and check our blueprint and see what's happening. So if I look here, we're sort of always getting the axis. So we're always triggering the event and then we're always moving. And I believe that's because we've always got this scale value set to one. So we're actually just always moving at a value of one. And that's why we're kind of going rightward and forward. 
So I'll stop playing there. And this is a good demonstration of how you can sort of debug things in Unreal. So you can actually switch out of your character view and go look at the blueprints and see where the data is moving in that blueprint. So what I'm gonna do is connect my axis value to the scale value here so that the scale actually updates based on when we're pressing the keys from our input. And we'll compile that and try again. So as you can see, now we're not moving, but I can press W, A, S, and D, and I start translating. But you'll notice that something else is going wrong. What's happening is that we're getting the world space vector for forward and rightward movement. And it's actually not taking into account the direction or orientation of our player. So we're kind of moving along these global axis when really we should be moving based on the way we're facing. So to fix that, we're gonna go back to our FPS controller and we're going to add a few more nodes to this chain here to make sure that our forward and rightward vectors are based on the orientation of our actual character and not a world space vector. So the first thing we need to do is get the rotation of our character. So I'm gonna right click again and create a new node and I'm gonna search get control rotation. So get control rotation. And we can hover over that and see the tool tip that says, we're gonna get the rotation of the controller, often the view rotation of this pawn. And so we're getting the direction that blue arrow is facing. Now we need to do something with that value. So we're gonna use a break rotator and it's gonna take that X, Y, Z value and break it into our different rotation values. So we've got roll, pitch, and yaw. So all we're actually interested in is the yaw because we're always gonna be moving along this one sort of axis of rotation. We're not a plane that's flying through the air and has to worry about 3D movement. We're kind of moving along a 2D plane, like our Cartesian space here. So I'm going to take the Z yaw and I'm going to input that into a rotator. So a make rotator. And we might actually have to disconnect this here because you can see it got a bit me messed up and it connected the yaw to the roll. So to uncouple any of these, you can hold alt and click on the link here between them if you can manage to <laughs> click it. And we can grab the Z yaw and connect it again. The other way to do that is if you do just want to have that one connection, you can hold control and grab the node and then you can move it around and reconnect it to another point. So we're getting the control rotation. We're breaking it up into X, Y, and Z. And then we're turning that into an active rotation value, which we can use to transform these vectors. So I'm going to send this return value into both our forward and our rightward vector. And now we can save and test it out. So you can see, unlike before, we're now moving correctly based on our character's rotation. So if I press W, I'm moving straight forward. S, I'm moving straight back. By the way, if you wanna get your mouse cursor back while you're in play mode, you can press Shift F1, and that gets you your mouse back. And you can also press eject and that allows you to still keep playing and simulating, but go back into this editor sort of view. And then we can go back to the controller and move that around again as well. To quit out of game mode, um, if you didn't figure that out already, that is escape. Excellent. So we've set up our movement. The next thing we need to do is set up our looking around. So to set up our looking around with our mouse, we need to set up another axis, which is gonna be for our look. So similar as before, we're gonna go back to edit, project settings. So we're gonna scroll all the way down until we found, find our inputs. And we're going to close these move forward and rightward axis mappings down. And we're gonna create two more axis mappings. So I'm going to name the first axis look up and I'm going to name the other one look turn. Unlike key bindings, we've got one digital 
reading, which is going to go positive and negative automatically as we move the mouse around the screen. Whereas a keyboard is analog, so it only has one direction. So all we need to do here is set up our different mouse axes. So we can, instead of clicking this keyboard button, we'll click the menu here and we'll open up mouse. And we're going to choose mouse X or mouse Y. Now, thankfully, the direction of mouse X and Y are consistent. So we're going to choose Y and we're going to choose mouse X for our look right or look turn. One thing to note here is we need to invert our mouse Y because otherwise it's going to use tank controls and when we push the value up, we're going to actually be looking down. So you could leave this at one if you like inverted mouse controls. I don't, so I'm going to do negative one and we're right to close that off. All right, so heading back to our FPS controller blueprint once again, and what we might want to do is wrap up all of these movement controls into one sort of section. So what I'm going to do is drag and select all of these and press the C key on my keyboard. And C stands for comments, and we can just name this part of our code move. So these are all our move nodes in our bl movement blueprint. And we'll start another section underneath here for our look. Look is much simpler to set up. So all we need to do is grab our two different inputs. So I'm gonna grab the look turn. And remember we want the event. And I'm going to grab look up. And now we can drag off the event here and add in a controller input. So if we search controller inputs, we can see the different axes we have here. And I always get these wrong, so I've got my cheat sheet here to <laughs> check it. Um, but I believe looking and turning around is your yaw. So it's like which way we're facing left or right. That's going to be our look yaw. And remember to connect the axis value as well. And we're going to connect our look up to the pitch because we're pitching the camera up or down. So I'm going to search pitch, add controller pitch input and connect up the axis value. And then we can wrap those up nicely in a comment as well and name it look. And we'll save that out now. Come back to our game scene and press play. And now we have look controls. And that looks pretty good to me. Now, some of you might press play there and find that immediately your character can't look up. You're just looking left and right. And what you need to make sure is that you've got both control rotation pitch and your selected here. So I would just double check that. I'm actually, I believe it's working for me here because I didn't have a camera connected. If I actually turn that off and go back to FPS controller and add a camera in the head of my character, because it's useful to have a proper game camera there for stuff like depth of field, etc. And if I press play, you can see that now I can't look up and down. I'm just looking left and right. So if you've got a camera set up with your character, you need to also enable controller rotation pitch in the pawn settings in your actual game view here. And now I've got that. Cool, so we can move around, um, but we're sort of walking through everything. And that's because our 3D meshes here don't have any collision to speak of. We can tell that our character's got collision because we're not falling through the world, but these islands don't have any collision. So I'm going to leave game mode for a sec and we're going to go back to our, we're going to go back to our content drawer and find these assets here. Thankfully in Unreal, collision exists inside the actual 3D objects themselves. It doesn't exist within instances in the world. So I think it's much more straightforward to understand and set up than Unity's implementation. 
So what we can do is open up our content browser and double click on our cliff here. And we're going to go into the blueprint view or the editor view for that object. What we can do from here is come up to this collision tab at the top and we can generate an automatic convex collision. So if we click this one here, it's going to create a convex map for us. Now to actually view that map, what we need to do is change from our lit view here to our player collision view. So if we click that, and then we come down here and press apply on our convex decomposition. I don't know why it's called decomposition, but we click that one here. We're going to see that it's generated a collision map based on the 3D geometry of that shape. Now this map is probably okay for this cliff, but it's not very accurate. And you can see that it's got a big section which sticks out here. Whereas our mesh, if we go back to our lit view, should really have a bit more of an indent in that section. Although maybe it's, it's not too bad actually. If we do want to increase the detail of this collision mesh, which you might need to do for some objects, but not others, we can increase the amount of hulls, which are like larger areas. And then we can also increase the amount of separate triangles within those hulls and also increase the amount of precision here. And if I press apply and wait for that to generate again, and this is going to take a few more seconds, we're going to get a much more detailed collision map for that object. You can see that looks way better. So we'll save that one out and we'll do the same thing for our other mesh here, our island. So we'll double click that one and we're going to create a convex collision map and just increase the precision here a little bit. See what that gives us to start with. That's pretty simple for this shape. So I'm definitely going to increase these other values just until I get something that I'm happy with. That's not going to feel bad for the player when they walk over it. So that to me is looking pretty good. And we can go back to our game view and test that out. So now I'm actually walking into it and at spots where the angle isn't too bad, my character can kind of automatically slide up and walk over that object. Another function that's usually desirable with the first person controller is a jump because we might be wanting to jump up on top of this rock in areas that we can't simply walk up. And I'll show you how to set that up really quickly. So we're going to go up to edit here under project settings again and back to our input tab. This time, because we're not doing a movement axis, we're just doing an action, which is jumping. So it's just an action that triggers when we hit the space bar. We're going to create an action mapping, name it jump and click the keyboard here and press space. So we'll go back to our event graph. And we're going to create another section, which is going to be for jumping. So I'm going to just organize things a bit here. So we're going to grab our jump event. So if we right click and search jump, we've got our action events jump. And we want to trigger the jump when the key is pressed, not released. So it's going to happen instantly when we key down. So we'll drag off pressed. And Unreal is pretty good. We can just search jump and there's a preset function for jump. That's basically all we need to do there. And now if we go back to our character, we press play and I press space, I'm doing a jump. Now the jump is a bit weak. So we might want to adjust some of the variables of that jump as well. So if we go back to our FPS controller again, I'm going to also do this because I love organization. If we go back to our viewport view and then click on our FPS controller, you can see our detail tab just populated here and I'll drag this out. These are all the preset variables for our character. So what I can actually do is search for jump here. And you can see I've got all these settings relating to jumping. 
And one of them here is the jump Z velocity. So it's going to be the height of our jump. So I could double that, which is going to be a bit of a space jump and press play. And now if I press space, I'm jumping twice as high. What I would love everyone to try and do for their first week homework is to use the Quixel assets in the same way we did today and create a different looking environment. And using the character controller you've just set up, think about how you might want to create a basic 3D platformer or something of the like. All right, thank you so much and I hope you enjoyed the tutorial. Cheers.